All right. Thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Randall Stevens. Uh, I saw a lot of names uh, that I recognize, so uh, I think I know a lot of you that are on this call today. Um, I'm going to spend, we've got this scheduled for an hour, where it's pretty easy uh, to take up the hour if we want to, as much as we want to dig in uh, to what's going on on this front. Um, <clears throat> I am going to um, run you through some of the features that we have just put out in our 4.3 preview release. For those of you that are new to Avail, it's basically what we call our betas. Uh, preview releases, they're not generally meant for production, uh, but they're robust enough that we feel like we want to get it out, uh, get last, uh, last bits of feedback from customers, uh, see the product and how it's interacting in the wild. Uh, make sure that there's uh, no last minute problems before we put it out as a production release. So we appreciate all of your all's help in this part of the process. And um, let's get started. I'm going to, uh, uh, before we do, I've got a couple of uh, co-hosts on here with me. Uh, Todd Trivisano, who a lot of you all may have interacted with, uh, runs our customer success team. Uh, so Todd's going to help out. Um, if there's any point uh, today, two things I'll ask. I'm going to be showing you some new features. Uh, you know, use the chat or feedback if you uh, if you think that this is something that's going to be useful. Give us some feedback there. Also, if you'd like to, you know, we have no problem opening up the mic and and let's make this as interactive and we can have some conversation. And if you want to do that, you know, while I'm talking about something, happy to stop and engage. Uh, we can definitely at the at the end of this, assuming we have some time, open this up for as long as you all want to. Uh, uh, have some discussion, open dialogue about this. Uh, also joining us, uh, Corey Rubidoux. Corey is the CEO of ArcVision, which if most of you know the history of Avail, uh, Avail actually spun out of ArcVision several years ago. Corey's the CEO, and one of the things we're going to be showing you today is some joint development efforts uh, with some of ArcVision's products and how that's integrating more tightly with Avail. So Happy that Corey's going to join us, and he'll be able to answer any questions that, the questions that I won't be able to answer as far as uh, that side of the product direction. Um, but anyway, thanks uh, thanks again for joining us. I've got uh, Todd. Can you confirm that you're seeing the screen? Everybody's seeing this. Yep, I am seeing it. All right. Um, so this is a four dot three release. Um, this has been available to you for. Uh, probably about a week, a little over a week. Uh, it was released kind of in conjunction uh, with our 423 release. So there was a production 423 release. There was some uh, communication that you should have gotten uh, about a week ago. Uh, and in that communication, it also announced that the 43 preview release was available. The preview releases are only available to our customers. And the way you access that preview release is by logging in to your Avail account through the web and going to the uh, management portal on the back end. And you should see in the left-hand column uh, preview uh, tab. And that is where you can get access to the preview releases of the software. So um, there's really two key features. I'm gonna talk about several things because of what this affects, but there's two primary features that are new to Avail that are part of this 4.3 4 release. So uh, for those of you that have been with us for a while, you know that uh, you know as we develop these features, as soon as we feel like they're kind of ready, we like to get them out into a release so that you all can start taking advantage of it. So this usually happens, you know, the cadence is two or three times a year that we're kind of putting out what we would call a major release that's got some new features. So this is one of those. Um, it's just now going out, right, for you all to start putting your hands on. And uh, when people ask me when it's going to be ready for production, uh, my answer to that is usually that it's ready when it's ready or it's ready when the customers say it's ready. So this is why it's important for us to get this in your all's hands uh, so that you can go out and, uh, you know, tell us if it's ready and you, you know, want to get it into production and not seeing any problems. Um, so that's the goal. The other, uh, so the two kind of features, the primary features that are in this release are what we call key cards. I'm gonna give you, if you all know me, I like to give you live demos of this stuff. So as soon as I kind of get through these slides, we'll jump right into the software and I'll show you the ins and outs kind of what's going on. Uh, but we've got a new feature called key cards. A lot of you have probably uh, seen this as we've talked about it on the roadmap and um, a new feature called dynamic paths, which is really solving uh, some of the content storage or, or 
improves the flexibility with where you can now think about storing content. And then, as I said, um, I've got Corey joining us. ArcVision has a new product called Fovia. Uh, we are even product that's also being integrated as uh, into Avail through what we call our lenses, which is a, a plug-in architecture basically to Avail. So we're going to show you some of the early uh, manifestation of that. It's actually in this 4.3 preview release so that you all can start to also see it and talk about it and think about how it could be used in your environment. Um, but we'll uh, spend a little time and show you kind of what the vision is for how this is all going to work. The um, so let's start with key cards. Uh, this is the most visual. It's probably the thing that you'll you can easily put into uh, uh, put into practice inside your firm. It should affect uh, and be a positive impact on your end users and how they're interacting with the content. So it's probably something that you all can put to good use uh, sooner than later. So uh, the way to think about key cards uh, for those of you that have been using Avail, uh, the current uh, 4.0 release, you know we introduced what we call channel cards, which was you know, the, the channels have graphics that you can customize and go with that. What we've done is we've taken that same concept, uh, again, back around wanting to have a highly visual interface to help organize this content. What key cards do is, is now within a channel. So inside each channel, you can now present the same kind of, uh, I, I call them gateways. Think of it as like a gateway to content. So rather than just seeing all of the content when you come into a channel, it's what we would refer to or I refer to specifically as being flat. You're just seeing kind of all of it uh, in alphabetical order. Of course, you've got your tags and keys at the bottom in the filters panel to be able to, or, to search and or filter that content. What key cards do though, is it lets you elevate that those key value pairs of data up into a visual so that now uh, users can like click through, I, I think of them as gateways. So it's a, just a graphic visual way to, to narrow down your content. And in reality, all that's doing is performing a search based on your tag driven data. So we think if one it continues to improve on the visual nature of this, uh, so that people are finding and more easily finding uh, uh, ways to get to this. It gives you the tools as the managers of these channels to kind of create these groupings based on keys. It is, as you see me noted here, it is data-driven, which we think is one of the really important things. So once you kind of set this up, as long as you keep putting the right tags uh, on your content, it'll drive the rest of this kind of in an automated way. So it's pretty slick. Uh, it's one of those things that, We've been working on this uh, all year, uh, since the beginning of the year. And uh, so we're getting kind of used to it internally, but uh, now it's ready for you all to start taking advantage of. Uh, you do have the ability to customize all those graphics to your kind of heart's content. So there's a basic editor that's in there that lets you just quickly, you know, you'll see, you can just quickly turn them on and get just text on, you know, solid backgrounds, but you can also think about creating your own custom graphics and customizing that. I'll show you some examples that we've done uh, to give you an idea. It's also uh, what we call stackable, meaning because these key cards are driven by keys, you can actually have layers of keys. So you can actually, you know, if, back to the gate uh, metaphor, if you think about going through a series of gates, it's like the narrowing effect, just like it is in the filters panel, just kind of elevated to a visual, uh, visual element. Uh, the other uh, primary feature in this 4.3 release is what we call dynamic paths. So this gets a little wonkier to uh, kind of explain what's going on, but I think as I show you all examples, you'll get it. And um, so we have, for the last couple of years, had a lot of emphasis on supporting and being able to support this, you know, what we refer to as your bring your own storage strategy. Our goal is not only to let you manage any and all content, but any and all content from any location that you've decided that that content needs to live or be stored. And really over the last, uh, over the last year and a half, a couple of years, it's become very evident that content, the advent of, of, of the advent of cloud storage locations and all kinds of different places, it's, it's actually uh, solving some problems, but creating brand new problems in that our content and our information is now starting to live in all kinds of different places. So our strategy with Avail is to try to let Avail be on the front end of that and support that you may have content living in BIM 360, living in OneDrive, living in all these other kind of uh, network and cloud locations that this is going. So with that said, <clears throat> one of the problems that, that we see that probably all of you all encounter with 
uh, these cloud hosted uh, content solutions is they most of them all uh, connect to the desktop through these desktop connectors. So we've all seen it with uh, BIM 360, you got a desktop connector, which lets you see that content in your Windows File Explorer window. Same thing with OneDrive or Google Drive or whatever it is that you're using. All of those solutions tend to tend to solve that problem in the same way. They use a what's called a desktop connector usually, and it lets that information show up in Windows File Explorer, even though it's only ever you know brought down unless you've told it to or interacted with that content. The problem that then is encountered is that where that content gets cached, think of it when you download that content that you're in a content cache locally, the file path for where that data is stored is different on each user's machine because for most all of these solutions, the default path for that storage is in your user namespace. So it'll look like, um, you know, C colon, I've got a slide right after the C colon slash user slash M360, yada, yada, yada. And that looks different on each person's machine. So from a Vail standpoint, that became a problem because we're always needing to know what the address of the file is. This new dynamic paths uh, feature solves that problem by dynamically resolving the address at each person's machine locally. So what that does is it opens up for you the ability to think about new places where you might want to store your content information, either by choice or by force that you've got to store information in certain places. So I'm going to give you some examples. We've tested this. It's a generalized solution. You know, uh, it's it just it just works uh, kind of with all of these solutions. But this is this is one of the features that we really need your all's feedback in the wild in your environments. We need to start testing to make sure that it's working as described and as, as we think it should. A lot of this, I won't get into too much technicality about what's going on, but we are uh, on each person's machine looking in the registry of that person's, the Windows registry, to see which of these services are installed. And it's through that that we know where that data is being stored. And then we, on the back end of Avail, are storing um, as an environment variable, if you if you know what environment variables are, we're kind of storing these paths uh, uh, and, and resolving that at each person's machine uh, for use. So it's pretty exciting. I'm going to give you a demo and show you, you know, OneDrive, uh, Google Docs, Google Drive, uh, uh, BIM, Autodesk BIM 360 Docs. It just works and it's pretty magical when you start to see it. Um, uh, this is uh, what I was talking about. You know, if you if you go look at where that data is actually going, it usually goes into some namespace like this. And again, that's that's the generalized problem that we set out to solve. And uh, I think we're there or very close to being there. Um, again, you can now look at all of these cloud based solutions. They all tend to connect to the desktop in this way and um, it just works. So we think we've got a. Uh, a good handle on that. Um, the um, the last thing that we'll focus on is this ArcVision Fovea lens, which lens again is what we're calling our plugins to avail. Uh, Fovea is a new content, both we'll call it content creation. It's actually, uh, we'll, and Corey can talk more about this, but it's actually able to bring in different file types like a GLTF, GLB files that you can now get in a lot of different places and get that into the environment where it's an RPC and you can bring it right in. This uh, uh, It's pretty slick. And um, bi the bigger picture though is, is seeing a web-based application like this integrated into the interface of Avail as a lens and as the content is generated it, it, it has the promise of taking away all those steps of downloading and deciding where to go put it. It's just already in the environment and takes out, um, you know, a, a, a lot of those steps about where content. And so it's really managed from the time of creation all the way through this process. And uh, the other thing that I'd really like to get your all's feedback on, but uh, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of, of something you have to really start to think about, but it, in my mind, one of maybe the most powerful things about it is it has the promise of simplifying license management. So when we show this to you, you can think about that you can go buy a product from somebody, license something from, from ArcVision, 
but not have to go create accounts and, and manage logins and manage user logins. That's all has uh, can be managed because it is happening inside of Avail. So I think it's, you know, it should be this promise of it's as easy as just sharing a channel in Avail and you basically have uh, conveyed rights to whoever you've shared that with and all the licensing and licensing management is just as easy as that. It's that simple. So uh, pretty exciting, I think, uh, kind of direction on that front. So all of this, uh, I'm going to finish these <clears throat> finish these slides up and jump into giving you a demo. But you know, all of this is part of our mission, right? Is fewer fewer things to manage on your all's front, uh, fewer apps for your users to have to learn if this all becomes kind of integrated into the one app. You should continue to have access to all sources of your data and information uh, through the avail interface. And you know, you hear us talking about avail being future proof. This is this is all part of our, you know, being agnostic to the content, being agnostic to where the content's being stored. This is all part of making avail, um, you know, viable as you begin to uh, use new applications and new use new workflows inside of your environments. That avail sh shouldn't just be a single purpose app, uh, but should be able to be used for a wide variety of, of kind of purposes on the front. So. That said, we'll come back at the end. Sorry, there it cut out just as you were on your last sentence, but I think we're back now. Um, but yep, I'll keep an eye on questions. And nope, oh, I'm cutting out now, aren't I? All right, everybody should be able. Todd, can you see my? Uh, Yes, I am seeing it. Sorry, if my, my, I might be cutting out a little bit. Yeah, you're cutting out on me. Can maybe one of our guests put something in the uh, chat? Let us know if you're if it's breaking up on you all as well. Looks like you're coming in smooth again now. So, okay, thanks. You all can if if you all are having any trouble hearing anything, just let us know and. We'll, uh... Oh, hey, that's a good feedback here. The chat uh, it says it's currently disabled. So, uh, can we turn that on? I we certainly should be able to. I don't know if I can. You may have to. But. Let's see. All right, it looks like the Q and A. So you can't chat. You can use the Q and A though. We're seeing some people. All right, so we'll uh, let me get into uh, this demo. So uh, you know, there's there's several things. There's a few subtle nuanced things that you'll see in this interface um, that that actually started changing in the 423 release. This 43 release is making some other changes. Uh, you'll see some subtle changes to the general interface with the search bar. Uh, and I'm going to point out uh, a couple of things that hopefully if I were going to, we've been great. <laughs> I'll just say we made a great improvement in these. I think it's in the 423 release on notifications. But you'll start to see the indexing flow is uh, the indexing and bringing information into avail changed uh, mainly to support new API changes that we've had. But because of those changes, it's allowed us to improve on the notifications. So you should see a progress bar that gives you a much better indicator of how much time is left, uh, how much what percentage of the job has been completed. That'll also show up as your um, you know, virtualizing thumbnails or doing any of those kinds of jobs. Uh, that's that's a huge uh, improvement just in general feedback uh, that, that I think everybody's going to uh, applaud. Uh, the um, So these are all things that we know about, and sometimes it's just a, techno, a technical reason why we haven't gotten to them. Uh, and that's a, that's a good example of that and trying to improve the notification of, of, of this in the interface. So let me, I'm going to start out though, and I'm going to talk about the key cards so we're all used to, you know, the kind of visual improvement that we made with these channel cards. Now what we've done, though, is uh, put this inside of a channel. So I'm going to go into this Revit library channel. And what you're going to see is I've actually uh, kind of on purpose three different uh, Revit libraries in here with different versions of Revit all in the same channel. So, you know, you could always do this before, but you can see that I've now got these, what we call the key cards on the front end of this. And if I just double click on that, right, this is why I think of it as like a gateway. It like takes me into that 
you know, into that think You can think of it like a sub channel. It's really not a channel, but it's a way of a grouping or a way of thinking about grouping content. And really behind the scenes, what's going on is we're just executing searches based on the right kind of metadata. So this is uh, emphasizes the importance of keeping good tags and, and good information on your content. And the rest of this will just work. Um, what you're seeing here, you know, this was, uh, these are, this is what we call the grid view. I'm going to show you what the interface for managing this looks like in a second, but you can see that I was able to customize these with some nice graphics. And again, if I double click and drill in, you'll notice down below that it's just executing, uh, uh, you know, it's, a, it's as if I had just chosen that to, to drill down. And now that I'm in here looking at this content, if you look across the top, these, this is another form of the same key cards this is what we call the banner view. So now when I'm within a channel, I can actually just use this as filters. So much like on the front home screen, when you're used to doing a global search and we bring back the channels it's in and you can, you can both filter and or double click to go into that, we do the same thing. You can double click. So a lot of the, the kind of mechanical behavior of clicks is the same as what you're used to doing on the front end. And now we're doing that within a channel. And you can see that I can continue to use this to filter in, quickly see different kinds of content. So, you know, we think that this is gonna be, um, you know, very helpful for people to be able to get to that content. If you've got a lot of these, you can just use your scroll wheel and it'll automatically, just as you mouse over it, you can scroll left and right to see more of this and you can just filter things out. So makes it uh, very quick and easy. You could still do your same searches. You can see that all this is really doing is executing these searches uh, down below in the uh, in the filters panel. The other part of this that we've begun to introduce then is this concept of a bread bread trail, breadcrumb trail. So um, you know you can see I can actually go back and forth. So I can go all the way back out to my 2023 level, maybe drill into civil. And then I can, you know, filter out to certain uh, certain content within that, and you can navigate now through this uh, breadcrumb trail back and forth within a channel. So, um, go into here. You can see I can filter out my cable trays, pipe fittings. Again, if I double click, it's just going to drill me in, execute that, and I can actually have this is what we call the when I said these are stackable. I'm taking different kinds of keys. And I'm stacking those uh, through some progression that makes sense uh, for the specific content. So um, uh, the other thing just to note that when you're in one of these channels, if you go up, uh, uh, you know, under the, uh, the menu up here, you actually have the ability to turn off these key cards. And that is not, uh, you know, this is one of the open questions here internally is, the language that we use, this does turn them off, but this is actually available to all users. So you can publish a channel and kind of push it out with these key cards. And by default, those will be on, but a user can actually turn those off if they want to turn those off. So that's not that's not a function of whether the key card feature is on or off for a channel. It's a function of each individual, whether they want to see those key cards as a, as a way of helping them navigate or not. So uh, just a just a side note on that. But you can see here as I turn them off, this is what you would normally see in this channel. And if I look down below at my tags, you know, I've got Revit version numbers. So that was my first level of key cards that I uh, created was using the Revit version. And then after you got into the Revit version, I used this discipline key to drive, uh, you know, the different kinds of content that all lived in this one channel. So, and then I use Revit category and subcategory then as additional. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, so over here on the right, uh, you're hopefully you've already used our tag IO lens uh, uh, feature. The new key card editor will also show up. It was actually developed as a plugin lens as well. Um, so what you're seeing here is it's on a per channel basis. You'll pop this up. And you can see here that I uh, I can add continue adding keys. This is just pulling from your tag data uh, of which things that you want to elevate uh, to these key cards. Uh, so I chose Revit version, and it automatically pulled this data in. Here you can see the discipline. Uh, here were the Revit categories and the Revit subcategories. The other parts of this interface, it's it's pretty simple once you get in there. You're either deciding whether these things are banner or uh, gridded view or a banner view. So 
uh, I'll just show you an example. I've got both of these as grid views. I can go to this Revit category and say, no, switch that also to be grid view and the subcategory to grid view, republish that, it's that quick. And now when I go back, here's another nice thing. We've got these new refresh buttons that tell you something's changed. So now it's gonna refresh. And I need to turn my key cards back on. So now I come back to that same front. I drill in to the next level. It's asked me about discipline and I say architectural. And now what I should be presented with are those cards, right? But now they're in grid view instead of that banner view. So it's up to you. You know, it's, it's very content specific of the way you think it's best to start to organize this, but I could go into the doors and then I could have to drill in, here's the door hardware, or you know, here's the specific information. So it's that easy to uh, kind of set this stuff up. I'll, I'll do a, a clean example here in a second and show you from scratch. But And then uh, once you've got this content set up, you can select each, each of the values, right, that are driven from that. And cust you know, we've got some just simple uh, change in the color of the text, change in the color of the background, the alignment of the text on the card. Uh, so it's just some very simple editor. And then you have the ability though to upload your own image. So you can actually turn off the text, uh, built-in text uh, representation of that if you want, and just uh, you can affect the, the opacity. So if you wanted just a uh, you know, a nice photo or something behind something with some text on it. We've made that pretty easy. And you can also multi-select in this editor and do all that at once. So if I wanted all of those opacities to change. So pretty slick uh, little editor there. Uh, let's just, and then once you've made those changes, all you do is hit publish. That's it. And you should go back out, refresh and see all of your changes. So made that really easy to, uh, uh, to, to put into action, right? And uh, the biggest thing is, you know, how much time you want to spend creating customized graphic versus just using the text or some minimal kind of, uh, uh, you know, minimal kind of work on creating those custom graphics. We've actually been working on a new feature which will create kind of a better looking graphic from the content of that type that you're creating the key for. So we may, you know, we'll likely put out some, some improvements on that. But let me, sh let me give you an example. If I go to a channel that is, um, that doesn't have any key cards. So here I've got a materials channel with some V-Ray materials. I've got category, I've got some color, uh, colors that are defined. So if I went in here and the first thing it's gonna do is say, select the keys that you want. So I'm gonna use the category. It pulls in all of those values automatically. And then I may say, well, I'm going to also stack color, uh, but I want the color to be a banner style graphic. And it's that easy. If I want to go change the text, you know, I can do that. Uh, but all I do is publish it and come back, refresh the channel. And at that, from that point forward, anybody that you shared that channel with that has for three installed would see these kinds of cards. And this is gonna allow me to, you know, drill in, see content, but then if I wanna filter out by color, right? And again, it's all data driven. So make sure you've got good data on your content and this should drive, uh, drive that interface. Pretty simple. Any questions or comments on that front? Yeah, we had some good comments and questions. I answered some in, uh, directly in the in the Q and A, but some that uh, came in. One was, you know, you know, what's the advantage? And just question on that ability for a user to be able to kind of show or hide key cards. You know, what was the thought process in giving users that um, possibility? Yeah, some some of just behavioral. Like if somebody's, you know, if all this, if you change those behaviors tomorrow, and somebody's been used to getting using the filters panel or doing some other means of getting to that content, and you've made them, you know, maybe you got uh, uh, zealous and created two or three layers deep that they would have to click through to get to something that they're used to just jumping to, you know, they may choose, and that should be persistent on a per user basis how they've turned that on or off. So if they're used to and rather just see, you know, the content as they've used to been seeing it, that individual user can just go turn it off and still get there. Um, 
otherwise, right, as you begin to publish that content. You know, this is the kind of stuff, though, as we get it out there, it's like, if somebody wanted to make the argument that we should take that away before we put it out into production, then make the argument and, you know, we can play in. But that was the rationalization for letting people do it, right? Um, go ahead. Yeah, we had one other question. Um, so, yeah, just kind of clarification, like, this is based on keys, key pairs, it's the wording here, not specifics or a specific pair. Like if I wanted to, uh, a key card of just of one of my keywords, uh, doesn't seem like that's the idea. Go, go create, you'd have to just go create another key with that keyword on it. Because what the key card editor does is it takes a key and the values that are associated with that key and brings those in as the gateways. So if you had a reason to just have like a single thing, then just go create a new key, call it whatever you want. You'll notice the keys don't show up. So you could, you know, you, you could have that um, create it. And then you can even pretty sure if I go into, that's a good question. If I go in here now and say, hide the element type, Let's just say I want to hide this so that the user doesn't see it. I haven't actually tried this, so this is a uh, this is really on the fly. So if I now hide the element type from the end users in the filters panel and I refresh this, it's still going to show up this way. But if I go in and look, you'll see that the user never even knew that that key existed. Right? Doesn't show up. Okay. I had a couple more questions roll in if you want them. Sure. Uh, one was just um, a consideration of, you know, having it be a double click uh, on a key card versus a single click. Um, you know, uh, you know, I don't know if that just yeah, yeah. Pre preference or what would our thought process was on that. Well, you know, there's, there's a rational, you know, it, th these are all great questions and uh, you know, the problem with, with single clicks are that within Avail, we do a lot of things where it's like, if I select a piece of content with a single click, right? I have to double click like you would in Windows Fog Explorer to like, you know, to launch it or to, to launch some app that you wanna do something with it. When you single click, you know, we have lots of other secondary features, which is, you know, there's a difference between selecting, seeing, and then you know doing something with it, either a drag and drop or double clicking to execute. So a lot of our kind of you know what we're trying to follow is not to mix and match your ins and outs. And you know this may get into people that are used to Windows versus being on a Mac, right? That that had certain kind of mouse behaviors. But um, you know right now there's no other info that might show up. But in the future you might have additional info that would show up over here just by selecting it or, you know, telling you more about what's in there. So we do that at the content level. Um, so for us, it's, it's like this question of, Hey, double click is to actually do something versus selecting something and potentially seeing more information about it. So that's the rationalization, right or wrong. We might be wrong, but uh, you can argue, you know, uh, in all kinds of different directions, but that's the rationalization. And then one more quick question, just just verifying, you know, where someone creates key cards right now in the 4.3 preview, is this going to change anything in the 4.2 interface for users? Yeah, great question. So it should not affect anything. So uh, you should be able to install 4.3 on your desk. If you wanted to actually use that on some production content, it shouldn't affect it. It won't, it definitely, they just won't see the key cards as they continue to consume it. My recommendation would be go create some new channels and don't don't play around, you know, copy all that content over to a different channel and play with it there until we've kind of fully vetted out that we're not seeing any problems out there. But I mean, we've been using this internally and it's not causing any problems uh, on the data. It's unlikely that there's going to be any major changes to the way that we're writing and storing and delivering this data it has more to do with the application layer than the data layer. Uh, so it shouldn't cause any problems, but again, while it's in preview or beta, I would encourage you to play with it over on different content than your production content. All right. 
Uh, and we'll, we, we can open this back up at the end, but let me, uh, I'm gonna keep going before we run out of time. So the other uh, major feature of these dynamic paths, not a whole lot to show you here, except I'm gonna actually give you a demo. So I've got some content. I've got some content that, uh, let's see. So this, I've got some content that's sitting in Google Drive, which cloud hosted, um, cloud hosted content that's sitting over here in Google Drive in this channel. I've got some content that's sitting in OneDrive. Again, cloud hosted being delivered. I've virtualized these thumbnails. You can see how that works. I've got, um, I've actually got content sitting here. And I've got another channel where I've got some BIM 360 content that's living in being stored in BIM 360. So uh, what you're, before I kind of go show you what it does, you know, what you're used to seeing in Windows, you know, accessing this through Windows File Explorer would be, you know, here's my Autodesk Docs account. Here's this project that we've got. Here's where that data is actually living. So if I go down in here, shared, I've got this library and I've got, you know, families and folders, just full content, right? All the way down. And this is in my BIM 360 account. What you'll notice if you look at these icons, that file's been downloaded, but all these are not. They haven't been, you know, they're, they're, they're not cached locally yet. Uh, but if you look up here above, if I show you the address for where this content actually is on this machine that I'm demoing from, there's, this, there's the path, user Stevens, ACC docs, the account name, yada, 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 right? That address. So it's this part of the file path that causes the problems with resolving content. And that's true with almost all of this content. So if I were to go look at, you know, OneDrive, uh, I can drill in here, open up this piece of content, find its location and see the same thing that this is now showing up in my Stevens OneDrive avail, blah, 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 blah folder. Again, notice that this content hasn't been downloaded. You see the little icons. And just to kind of prove that out, you know, we're all kind of used to, if I go up here to my docs, just to prove that I don't have anything up my sleeve, I can right click on this and say, hey, I want to free up space, which would go and remove all the local cache. So now it's really just cloud hosted. Uh, same for my OneDrive. If I wanted to go in here and say, hey, free up space in OneDrive, got rid of my cache. I can do the same thing in all of these locations. So just to prove the point, right, that content is no longer in this local cache, but you can see how quickly that's being delivered. That's because we virtualize the thumbnails and the content experience is just quick and easy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up Revit. This is Revit 2023 that I'm running. We'll talk about that also here in a second, but oh, let's get this so we can see it. So Revit 2023, and here I have available desktop. The other thing that we're really driving towards is moving to this desktop app. In fact, there's some work being done to kind of finalize some work that has to happen on the plugin side on Revit. But the vision and the our, kind of our direction for this is to move towards everything out of this desktop. So I'm going to drag and drop this into this into this file. So that file has not been downloaded. So what you're going to see when I do this, all in one step it's gonna automatically trigger the download in the background. And this content happens to be Revit 2020, which means Revit has to upgrade that file. So this really happens fast now. <laughs> so it's that quick, right, for content to be downloaded and upgraded for somebody to bring content like this into their projects. So uh, it also opens up all kinds of new questions about do we have to worry we, the collective we, about keeping different versions of Revit files if the upgrade process is this quick, you know, what are the reasons to continue creating that complexity of having different versions? It either it's going to work in here and upgrade or not. Uh, so I'd love to have that conversation with some of you. I'm going to go back to home though, and I'm going to go to BIM 360 now. So here's content in BIM 360. Basically the same thing's gonna happen. A little bit slower, the desktop connector, you'll see it kick in. So as soon as I do the drag, you're gonna see that kick in to do the download. There was the upgrade and I brought the piece of content in and upgraded it. So 
all this is, you know, fair, you know, I would, I would call it fairly instantaneous, right? Instantaneous enough that it's not going to bother a user that they're going to see, uh, see any problems with this. Um, so there's uh, BIM 360. Let's go do the same thing from Google Drive. So here I am in Google Drive. Let's go grab a door. Uh, let's use our key cards up here to say it's a residential door we're looking for. And I'm going to bring this in and that quickly, the download happens, the upgrade happened, and it put me in placement mode to put it in that project. So pretty slick, right? And it just kind of works. And the exciting thing for, from our standpoint, though, is that, that it opens up this world of where you all can think about that your content needs or wants to be stored. And, uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, for the past year, I've been showing this example just to kind of drive the, the, the point home that in general, Avail handles content coming from any location. Uh, and I usually did it with this kind of example. It's like, look, here in one channel, I've got content that's in SharePoint, Box, Google Drive, OneDrive, on my local network, coming out of BIM 360, coming out of Dropbox. You know, if I took those labels away, as an end user, you would have no idea where the source of that content was coming. So it really separates and simplifies what it means for the users to see and have access and use content without the complexity of worrying about where that is on the back end. So um, I think it's going to open up all kinds of possibilities uh, for for how you all can think about uh, you know where you're going to be storing and want to store information in your net in your network. And one last comment on that, and then we'll jump over and I'll show you this fovea lens real quick. Um, when you are, you know, making the choice of where you want to store and put your content can be a separate issue than, than the simplicity of which it is for your users to get to it. So especially inside larger organizations, the other point there that I wanted to make was that, you know, we have our own cloud hosting and some of you are using that where we, you, we can put your content in our cloud and host it. For us, though, the, the real question is, as an organization, why would you, if you've already got a cloud hosting solution that you're using, BIM 360, OneDrive, whatever that may be, why add another one? That's just adding complexity and management, and IT complexity and all those types of things. So, you know, in the end, <clears throat> we could continue. We'll, we, we're not going to take away our cloud hosting, but this work that we did on dynamic paths was to, to do that very last step, which was, look, those all those companies that I've mentioned have spent lots of engineering time solving the problem of how to get that content down to your desktop. And they do it through these connectors and they do it through the, the, the those individual investments and making that all just work. So our goal was like, I don't want to, uh, we would end up in the very same place trying to build out the very same kinds of things. And I'm just adamant about like, just support what everybody else is already doing as opposed to us trying to write code to do the very same thing. So we tend to want to just support what's already out there and in use as opposed to, you know, introducing and trying to write code and do the very same thing over and over again. So, all right. Any questions on that, Todd? Yeah. A couple of questions. One, I think it's a good one um, that, uh, well, they're all good ones, but just uh, had this come up the other day, which is, uh, so will we not need the Revit browser anymore? Um, yeah, good, good question. So I'm going to answer this. Um, with some nuance. <laughs> the answer is our where we are moving is away from the browser in that Revit plugin. So we're always likely going to have to have a plugin in Revit, but it doesn't have to include the browsing window to content. It, we have to have the hooks there to do all the specialized stuff we do about getting content into Revit, but we don't have to replicate the interface so what we're seeing more and more of is more and more of our customers choosing not to use those browsers because you're now stuck in a very limited window using the Avail desktop. We are actually working now uh, on a, the next release of a Revit browser. It won't be a browser. It'll be a Revit plugin add-in, Avail plugin or add-in. And what we're going to do is be reducing that to actually be a search, probably a search bar. Uh, the first step is when you drag that family over, what you're missing is the ability to choose the type. 
we're doing what we call reversing the workflow there, where instead of pre-choosing which type you want to bring in, we're going to let the user drag the content in, and then we'll pop up a window in Revit and say, hey, there's multiple types. Do you want to load all of them or choose this one and go into placement mode? So it's a kind of reversing of the order of choice. We think it's going to make it much easier for the users to just drag, which is what most of them do anyway, just drag the content over and then uh, we'll present them with a secondary menu choice there. The other thing then kind of a fast follow to that development wise will be we're, we're working on integrating in that add in a search box so they could actually execute a search from within Revit. And then that would pop up this desktop into the appropriate channel or search context. So there's some work that's going on, on on how to best do that, but ultimately it would just pop the this interface up and then they can just drag and drop and use it. So there is a bunch of work going on to kind of rework and, and really simplify that workflow for the end users and the, on the Revit front. So, so what, what that's gonna mean is your existing browsers that you're using will work, continue to work. We won't make those not work, but we're not going to do any more development on it. We're moving towards you needing more of the screen real estate in this desktop. And the users won't know. It's just, it just pops up. It's just going to pop up this window and it's like, here's your content. You can drag and drop it. So. Yep. You, you, uh, you killed a couple birds with one stone there. So that's great. Kevin. Yeah, hopefully that covered your question as well. Let me know if you need extra clarification. Um, yeah, great feedback on that, Randall. And then just, you know, clarification on, so this content that's living in OneDrive or BIM 360, can you still preview the the PDFs within Avail? And, uh, yep. yep, should all just work. That, I don't right. know if I've got any good examples of it, but uh, yeah, the preview yep. work, everything. Preview panel, yep, great. Um, um, yeah, and yeah, lots of good feedback on consolidation to the desktop app. So we'd love to hear more of your feedback on that. Yep. Um, all right. Last thing, and then we can continue to open this up uh, for conversation, but uh, you're going to, you'll notice that there's another lens that's showing up in this release. I'll, I'll just say that when we finally come out of and put 4.3 into production, this may go away. We may then put out another preview release that has it so that we can continue uh, to, to uh, do the testing until we get all this finalized. But this is an example of where we think the future of, of lenses for avail, but the integration of third-party kind of applications. So this is uh, pretty slick. So, um, and Corey, you can you can jump in here, but what Fovia, uh, what Fovia does uh, kind of at some basic level is let you bring in uh, common file types, 3D data like GLTF. So I'm going to go over here to my Windows Explorer and I've got some content that I've got over here. So I'm just going to take a GLB file. Uh, you can download stuff like this from Sketchfab or TurboSquid, right? Lots of content sources out there for 3D content. So the idea is that, okay, GLB file, not sure if Revit can... I can bring that into Revit, but what Fovia does is opens that possibility up and it's this easy. I can now bring that in to the new Fovia uh, editor. Uh, and you'll notice that this is living right inside of a veil. What we're gonna do is take this probably week after next, have another session just devoted to this. So we won't get too deep into it today, but this basically gives you the ability to change colors of content, to control how much, you know, how dense your meshes are, all this information, you know, all that kind of control that, you know, of custom content the way you want it. And then ultimately, you know, though this is integrated into, uh, this is being integrated into a veil, so that you can actually direct the output directly into these channels. So we don't quite have everything wired up, but we're working on that behind the scenes uh, to make it that easy. What I'm gonna do here is just publish this piece of content. Um, so I could say, you know, let's give this a name of piece of luggage. It's gonna be a category. So this is all about, let's get it tagged and, and categorized, you know, with the, the way that we want that to be in there, I'm just going to say other, and then I can add tags, you know, it's both orange, uh, it is luggage, 
right? You can add as much metadata as you want, travel. And then you can choose things like, okay, do I want a simplified mesh or a bounding box for that? So let's just go really simply to a bounding box. And I'm actually just gonna hit publish. It's creating an RPC, which can then be used, right? Everywhere RPCs are supported, Revit, Enscape, Rhino, all up into the rendering engines, all of that. So that quickly, that content was created. So I'm gonna show you this ultimately will, uh, will go away. But you can see that that piece of content now in Fovia's interface is, is showing up. It's, it's still processing. Here's the content that you see over on my left in Avail that had already been processed. So if you all want to start testing this, you can actually just you know, hit the download button, download that RPC, put it in a stream path, and drive it into Avail. All that's going to go away, though. What's going to start happening is because this was launched in the context of this channel. The future of this is as soon as that was created, it would magically just show up already. So back to no downloads, no deciding where to put it, all that's been defined and being managed, you know, truly as content management by avail, you know, by this, by integrating this with avail and bringing it into your environment. So the kind of cool thing there is, you know, once this content is here, right? Again, we've integrated in the 3D viewers. So this, uh, this piece of content, you know, has full 3D viewing capabilities, previewing capabilities. And then ultimately, right, I want to bring that into my Revit scene. It's the same drag and drop action. That's an RPC that's in there and ready to render, ready to go into your visualization. So it's, we are, we are this close to starting to really streamline, right? These kind of comp, what, what if you step back from it were a complicated series of things and reducing it down and getting rid of the, what I would call the more mundane parts of it. Why should somebody have to worry about where it's being downloaded to? Why should I have to worry about where I wanna store that? It should all come in managed from the time of creation. So um, Corey, uh, any other comments on that front? Uh, no, I mean, it's really, um, Pretty simple, right? Uh, create content, manage content on the fly, um, without having without having to download index um, or any of that stuff. We just want to make this as easy and simple for people to use and, and consume this content as possible. So, so here, let me throw out something to get this crew thinking about, right? That's on this call. So here, I've got this fovea lens. What what we're working on is that there would be a fovea channel at least this is the way this is going to start that fovea channel might show up in the marketplace and you could decide to turn that fovea channel on that fovea channel would have that lens attached to it and then at that point you're the only person that has access to that but now you can go up to your normal sharing and say hey i'm going to share this with everyone in my plan and I'm either going to let them consume the content that's in there, or I'm going to give them editing privileges, which means they can use the lens to bring new content in. So this is what I was talking about. I think there's a really powerful concept here about you, those users, your you and or your individual users didn't have to go now create individual accounts at ArcVision in order for this to work. But the business model for ArcVision is, that, that the digital rights management is happening in Avail and how you are going to pay for that plug-in or service, that business model could either be consumption-based or user-based or whatever, but there wasn't another license management system. It's all happening through this interface and as easy as you doing this, sharing the channel with who should have access to it and who shouldn't. And my guess is that if all things work that way, Let's wave a magic wand. Imagine all the dozens of applications that you are having to manage licensing in some other license management system. Think of that no different as another content management system, how painful that is for you all. And what if that was reduced to as easy as I just share the channel out and that basically conveys access rights. Um, so love to hear more of your feedback. We're going to continue working in that direction. It's all part of simplifying this not only for what the end users are doing and how easy it is to use this stuff, but but also how easy it is for you all to manage it. So we're going to continue chipping away at that um, with what we're doing here. So, all right, let's uh, let's open this up to uh, general questions, comments. Anybody wants to uh, vocalize 
how cool any of these new features are. Our team would probably love to hear that, but. Uh, Yep, we've had some some good questions. There was questions on licensing uh, in the chat, which I think I don't know, Corey, if you want to speak to that a little bit. I know yeah, you're you've had some typed answers in there. Yeah, I was just getting to type but type in here, but uh, just to, to be clear about Fovia uh, itself, um, it does require an ArcVision subscription um, for any of the current Avail customers. Just reach out to me. I'll, um, I'm happy to get on board for, for testing and, and kicking this around a little bit before we get in the weeds on cost and pricing and all that good stuff um and then uh i will say that you know in the past um our any rpc that was that was uh, part of our subscription plan was was, was licensed content so to speak um and so, uh, of using RPCs in the past with watermarks and things like that. And we're, we're moving in a different direction with regards to actually licensing of the content. Um, technically speaking, right now, any piece of content that gets created through the Fovia um, uh, configuration configurator, basically that, that those RPCs or, or any of that content is, is license-free. So um, the whole purpose uh, behind that is, or meaning, sorry, the whole Logic behind that is because if you're obtaining models from other sources, if you go out and buy models from TurboSquid or buy something from Sketchfab or whatever, but you just really need to get it from from those applications or those environments into into Revit, it's really it's your model. You pay for it, and therefore um, we don't wrap a license around that piece of content. Um, it's literally just drag and drop that that asset from from um, from Avail into into uh, Revit. And basically render with, with any of your rendering engines that, that you're using right now. And like I said, I'm happy to to um, take emails from anybody uh, to to kick this around. So um, I can just make sure I'm not sure my email since chat's not working, but um, you can reach out to Todd and connect with me if, if needed. Anything else, Todd? Yeah, we've had some good comments on key cards uh, already. Really uh, digging that, and then just um, uh, you know, just questions and kind of encouragement on yeah, it, whatever um, kind of cloud locations you're using. Uh, we've done testing for everything that we're supporting uh, right now, um, but we absolutely need you to use it in your environments and let us know how it's working for you and and, and really need your feedback on that. So definitely check out the dynamic pathing, um, put that, put that to, to use. <laughs> yeah, that's probably the, I mean, the, the key cards, I think, are they should just be working. They're not going to, they don't affect much. The dynamic paths is where we really need your all's help. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing, you know, the, the goal is you're going to index content from your local source. So you need to have, have pulled that content down and accessing it through Windows Fog Explorer, all right, in, in OneDrive and BIM 360 through that interface. We'll take care of the path management and then ultimately to really test it, put some content in there from your corporate environment and then share that channel with somebody and let, they need to have 4.3 installed in order for that to resolve but their address of where that, you know, and then they need to have been given permission to that content through that source. So if it was BIM 360, they have permission to see it in BIM 360 or OneDrive. As long as that's in place and you put 4.3 in front of it, it should resolve properly for them. And just, you know, just like I was showing you, uh, they should be able to drag and drop and make sure it works. So that's where we could really use your all's help is to see, to make sure that that's working in your environments. What we what we want to make sure is that the addresses are what we think they are on each person's machine inside of your corporate environment. So if there's some problems with that, you know, we'd love to have you call attention to it and spend some time to show us in your environment what's going on there. And then we can use that as the kind of last tick before we get this out in general release. So. 
And some folks have already picked up on some of the, the other cool new features like the breadcrumb that's been introduced as well as the new and improved processing indicator for uh, for indexing, which is exciting. Yep. A lot of little subtle things, right? <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. That's just it's just great. So yeah, let us know your thoughts on that too. Some some folks have already uh, offered some good feedback on that, which I'll I'll take to the team for sure. So yep. Other things that are in process, we're actually working on a Harvest 3.0 for Revit. Uh, for those of you that have followed the roadmap, uh, we've been moving that processing to happen in Autodesk Forge on the back end. So making good progress on that front. There's also along the same lines, uh, kind of back end capabilities. We're working on a new archive feature. So you can do Revit project archival and have access to that without having to open the Revit original Revit project files. Uh, so that's underway. Those are things that we should, you know, see this fall. We're probably, we're probably, a, you know, a month or two behind, you know, the kind of published um, uh, roadmap that we always publish. And, you know, whenever we work on these roadmaps, you know, they're always just kind of, they're aspirational for sure. And uh, sometimes I kind of, in my own mind, you know, think like, well, is this when we're working on it or when it's supposed to be delivered? Obviously when I'm showing it to you, uh, you know, it's, it's, you would hope that that's a delivery date, uh, but for sure, because we work on these things and try to get them out to you as fast as possible there, they should be substantially the same, but we slipped a little bit on getting this, uh, these key cards and dynamic paths out. Uh, but you're going to see this archive and harvest stuff. It's coming, coming strong. Uh, so that'll be next queued up, but our goal is to get this tested. And as soon as you all say it's good, good to go, we'll get it out in a, in a production release. So that you all can start taking advantage of it. All right. If there's no other questions, we were almost right on time. So thanks everybody uh, for joining us and uh, get this downloaded if you haven't already and start kicking the tires and uh, give us some more feedback. Uh, as always, you can send any problems that you're having or comments about the features to uh, support at GetAvail. That'll come into Todd and the customer success team and they will manage it from that point forward. But thanks everybody for, for joining us this afternoon. Appreciate it.